Hey there, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. We'll be starting here oh, in the next uh, two to three minutes or so to wait for any last minute attendees. Thanks for joining. Be with you shortly. We're going to do a quick sound check here. Check, 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 sound check, sound check. Perfect. Thanks, guys. James, double check your output on your microphone. Um, see if that is what the problem is. Um, or maybe if you don't if you don't have any headphones, put some headphones in, that may help. And Steve, we'll see what we can do. Um, we're expecting the webinar to go around probably 40, 45 minutes. So I think by your hard stop at 2.30, we'll have covered a majority of what we need to talk about here today. Um, I'll keep that in mind though, but it should be only around 40 minutes. I wanna. Um, I'll go over the agenda here in the next few minutes or so, um, so you get an idea of what we're talking about. Let's see. Okay. All right, guys, let's get this started. Everybody, welcome to the webinar here today. This is part of another Fortress Power webinar hosted by yours truly. My name is Alex Lepore. I'm the Regional Southwest Sales Manager here at Fortress Power. We have a very exciting webinar today with a very popular host that goes by the name of Scott Hunt. Um, a few notes before we jump into the webinar here today, we will be setting out the slides and recording of this webinar. So don't feel like you have to feverishly jot down notes throughout this presentation, as we will have not only a recording of this, but also the actual slideshow um, for your convenience sent out maybe a day or two after we conclude this presentation. Presentation. There is a questions tab on your panel. If you have questions throughout the webinar, please put them in there and we will have someone address these questions either during the presentation or we will do them um, at the end between Scott and I. So with that being said, and for the sake of time, let's get this started. So here's what we're going to be going through today, everybody. We're going to be going through the company introductions, a little bit more um, on who Scott Hunt is and what Practical Preppers does, along with who Fortress Power is and what we do here at Fortress. We'll go through some of the different market trends that we're seeing with energy storage systems, um, talking about two of our products we have here at Fortress, our E-Flex and our E-Vault Max, some of the cool features of both of these products and where they can make a good fit for your home or a business. We're going to go through some case studies, um, see where we've not only done installations with Fortress and really pick Scott's brain on all these projects he's done over the years and what he's seen as well. And then, like I mentioned, we will do that Q&A at the end for 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the presentation. I will reiterate, please put some questions in the question tab um, so we can get them addressed at the end of the presentation here today. So with that said, uh, today we're luckily enough to host this presentation with Scott Hunt of Practical Preppers. So he's the founder and owner of Practical Preppers. And Practical Preppers, from my understanding, provides solar and water designs, materials and installations um, for all sorts of different renewable energy projects. If you haven't followed him on LinkedIn, I follow him and he posts all sorts of neat stuff, um, not only with Fortress Energy Storage batteries, but it could be with um, air conditioning projects or water pump projects and everything in between. So I highly recommend to follow him on LinkedIn if you get a minute, because he puts a lot of really good content on there um, and also pass along his YouTube channel as you see on the bottom here. 
Now, Scott's experience, he has a master's in mechanical engineering and over 20 years engineering experience um, in the renewable and, and some even in the non-renewable spaces. So he is an, a, uh, not only a Fortress authorized dealer, um, but he's also a Fortress authorized uh, system designer and installer. So he is your go-to guy for designing your home energy storage system, along with getting that home energy storage system installed, getting it through the proper permitting, X, Y, and Z. If you hadn't heard of it, he had written, he had uh, wrote a very um, informative book, The Complete Guide to Z Disaster Preparedness. It is the sole author of that. And most of you are probably familiar with his YouTube channel, Engineer775, where he has over 280,000 subscribers. This YouTube channel has useful tips and tricks when it comes to solar installations, energy storage installations, and everything in between. So I follow him on LinkedIn personally. It's a very good resource for me, even being in the battery space. I will highly recommend you do the same. I'm sure um, someone can put his uh, links to his social media followings in the questions tab so we all can have them moving forward. And a little bit about who we are here at Fortress Power. So like I mentioned, my name is Alex Lepore. I'm the regional uh, sales manager here. We are a battery provider providing lithium iron phosphate batteries for residential and commercial applications. The reason why we chose lithium iron phosphate in comparison to like a lead acid or a nickel manganese cobalt chemistry is that the lithium, and I think Scott will attest to this, is a heck of a lot safer and longer lasting. I think uh, when we go through some of these case studies, the proof is really gonna be in the pudding when we take a look at some of the projects and the longevity of these projects with lithium phosphate chemistry. We are headquartered right outside of Philadelphia in a small town called Southampton, Pennsylvania. It's around, I'd say 35 minutes northwest of the city of Philadelphia. We are founded way back in 2016. We're owned by a group of investment bankers and solar veterans. And as you guys can see here on the right-hand side, this is our facility. It's a 30,000 square foot facility. This is our headquarters. This is where we do our research and development, sales and logistics. Being around for the past five years, we've seen all sorts of different installations in the continental US, but also in Canada, the Central Caribbean, South America, Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. We are the key lithium battery supplier for SEPTA, which is a local railway company based outside of Philadelphia here. If you're a native to Philadelphia, you're very familiar with what SEPTA is or who they are, let me say. Hydro-Quebec, which is a Canadian utility company, and the Navajo Reservation out west in the Midwest. So we have a, our fair share of experience here at Fortress Power, and we provide lithium iron phosphate batteries for homes and businesses. So with that said, there's a lot of different ways that you can use your battery. You can use your battery in a time of use example. Scott has a very good example later in the, in the slideshow talking about time of use. Essentially, discharging your battery during peak times to save money on your electric bill. You can certainly use them in an emergency power application or even in an off-grid application, as well as using it um, if you want to basically reduce your demand charges, although that's typically for commercial or business applications. So a battery has evolved much more from just a backup system. And when we go through some of these case studies, you'll see you'll see some time of use applications, you'll see some off-grid applications, and certainly the classic emergency power application for when the grid goes down. Now there's a lot of buzz going on with lithium batteries right now um, with the growth of solar. And per a recent Department of Energy analysis, by 2030, stationary deployments are gonna exceed 150 gigawatt hours. So folks, if you look over here on the right-hand side, grid-related is really where Fortress Power, for example, would be, um, that would be our niche. This is batteries that are used in homes and businesses that may or may not be co connected to the grid. And you see here by 2030, from even 2021, we're gonna see exponential growth with batteries in the next, um, in the next nine years by the end of this decade. There's gonna be a 27% annual growth for grid-related storage applications, as you can see here. And the largest, largest market for this is gonna be North America. Now, you may be asking yourself, well, why are we seeing all this growth with batteries? What is really pushing this along? Why does this matter to me? What does this mean for me, essentially, if I'm sitting at home and Alex is talking with me, why is this? It comes down to, I think, three main factors. 
the first thing is the battery affordability, the actual cost of the battery. So for those of you that have followed solar, the cost of solar has fallen over 20% in the past five years. So as that trend kind of continues on with energy storage, we're expecting that price of energy storage to go down just like solar did over the past 10 or 15 years. And furthermore, by 2029, we're going to see a 46% price reduction in lithium battery cells. Now, this certainly does not mean wait and wait another nine years before you get a backup system for your home because you'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. So I think the key thing here is that this growth of batteries is not is partly due to the affordability. You can get the maximum bang for your buck nowadays with a lithium battery, depending on how you use it. Next, we're going to talk about some of the different incentives for energy storage, and the first thing that comes to mind is the federal ITC tax credit, which was extended into this year, which is 26% when you're adding your energy storage onto a solar system. Now, this does not apply if you just have a battery without solar. You need to make sure that the energy storage is installed with solar, and you get 26% off the bat um, paid for by the government for this ITC tax credit. For more information, I'd recommend getting in touch with your accountant um, or a tax expert, and they can walk you through the processes to take advantage of this 26% federal ITC tax credit. Depending on where you're located, there are a lot of different statewide incentives. A few that come to mind is the SGIP incentive for my Californians out there, the GMP incentive for those based here in the Northeast, like in Vermont and Massachusetts, as well as other statewide rebate programs, um, which will give rebates for solar and potentially energy storage. States like Colorado, I know Texas is looking at one. Um, Florida, I also know, is considering one. So depending on where you're located, and if you are interested in a solar and energy storage system for your home, save as much as you can. Get signed up for the federal ITC tax credit and any other statewide incentives that you may be eligible for. And the last thing here is we have this shifting mindset of energy storage, um, therefore pushing it to be very popular. The first thing is fear, bluntly. If we look at this report from the National Oceanic Atmospheric Association, NOAA, um, they're they predicted some new numbers on the average, quote unquote, Atlantic hurricane season. So you see here from 1981 to 2010, it was 12 named storms, six hurricanes and three major hurricanes. We can see here the new forecast is 14 named storms, seven hurricanes and three major hurricanes. Now I don't need to preach on bad weather because up here in the Northeast, we just got a whole um, bunch of flooding. If you were in Texas uh, in the past few months, you had that snowstorm out West, you have these wildfires. It's, it's kind of crazy. So having a solution to back up your home in the event of an outage, whether it be a hurricane, a winter storm, a wildfire, I don't know, an earthquake. I'm not sure how many more natural disasters I can list. However, Fear is really this thing that I think is really making people consider a clean, reliable energy storage system for their home or business. We now have this higher emphasis on renewables. We're seeing the effects of climate change taking place already um, with flooding and all these storms and things like that. And with the recent political administration change, that is certainly pushing for a cleaner uh, approach to, um, it's a not even local generation, but distributed generation across the US. So if someone asks you why are batteries becoming so popular, it's the affordability of the batteries, incentives tacked along with that affordability, and the need for a batter, battery, the need for power is higher than it's ever been. It's a safe, tangible investment that can be used over and over again. Fortress Power has a 10-year warranty on our systems, and even at that, some of our batteries are projected to go 12 to 15 years, depending on how you use them. So this really isn't just a if question anymore, it's a matter of a when question. When will you get a backup system? When are you going to avoid high utility costs, X, Y, and Z? Now, now we do have our two products, which are perfectly fit for all those applications I mentioned earlier, whether it's an off-grid application, you want to move yourself completely off the grid, or you want to have a battery for an emergency application when that next big storm hits, or maybe you're paying through the nose during peak times, getting a battery and discharging that battery during peak times is certainly a very uh, viable option for a more comprehensive return on investment. 
So over here on the left, we have our newest E-Vault Max. The E-Vault Max is around the size of a, let's say, college refrigerator, about yay high, it's slim, and it's scaled up to 370 kilowatt hours. So the 18.5 number is the nameplate capacity of the battery, 18.5 kilowatt hours, and you can put 20 of these batteries in parallel to get to 370 kilowatt hours. Now, for those of you that are thinking, Alex, I don't need 20 batteries, fair enough, um, but you can certainly do two, three, or four of these batteries for a whole home backup in the event of an outage. You'll see it has this local monitoring um, LCD display. So you can physically see right on your battery after Scott leaves your house, you can see the voltage of your battery, the current output of your battery in amps, what your state of charge is at on your battery, along with the power in KW. For those of you in California, it's the largest single unit that's approved with SGIP at 17.7 .7 kilowatt hours AC, meaning you, you really are getting the most bang for your buck with something like the E-Vault Max when you break down the dollars per kilowatt hours. And for my folks in, not in California, look at some of those statewide rebates, like I mentioned, it can make the, um, let's see, the price tag of a battery a little bit more manageable um, than if you weren't using a rebate or something like the ITC tax credit. Now, because of its larger size, it's gonna be very easy to install um, and get into your home or your business. And if you see here, this aluminum casing, this casing is aluminum, excuse me. So it's gonna look really nice and clean in or near your home. And it kind of brings me back to my original point. We use lithium iron phosphate, which is proven to be the safest chemistry, lithium chemistry on the market, since this battery, like I mentioned, will be installed near or around your home. Now on the right hand side, we have our eFlex 5.4. This is one of our newest products. It's a more modular solution, just in case you don't need something as large as the Evolt 18.5 Max. The key difference between the E-Flex and the Evolt is not only the size, 5.4 kilowatt hours versus 18.5 kilowatt hours, but the enclosure on the E-Flex is an IP65 aluminum enclosure mean that this unit is outdoor rated so for those of you that are not in the northeast where you have basements or large garages you can install this battery outside this unit is scalable up to 80 kilowatt hours and it's a little corny but it makes for a very flexible install since you can install it on the floor on the wall or even into a shelf rack or a racking system i have some case studies here on the next three slides four slides or so showing each of the different applications with our eflex it has closed communication, meaning that the, um, the battery management system in the battery will communicate with the inverter that you're using. The same thing here with the E-Vault Max here on the left-hand side. This also has the closed communication from the battery BMS to the inverter system. Now, I'm going to try and zoom in here. Oops. Nice. We try and zoom in here. You see this ribbing on the top of the E-Flex here? It's a um, integrated heat sink, which is going to allow for five times better thermal performance, meaning that in terms of overheating or, or um, let's say in cold environments, you're going to have much better thermal performance dealing with colder or hotter temperatures because of this integrated heat sink. This is what this ribbing is here on the top. So the key thing here, folks, is that depending on your project, depending on how much room you have in or near your home, the E-Flex or E-Vault Max are both um, viable options, but have their own respective pros and cons. For example, the Evolve Max is around 500 pounds, so that's a fairly large battery. The E-Flex, it's a more smaller, more modular battery, which, you know, is a little bit more flexible if you want to add on 5.4 kilowatt hour increments. So at the moment, getting in touch with Scott, talking with him about, do I want to go with the Max? Do I like the approach of the E-Flex for a smaller, more, let's say, chewable battery, or do I want the whole home you know, kit and, kit and caboodle with the Evolve Max. It's certainly up to your discretion on what you want for your home project. Now, with that said, let's jump into a few different case studies of where we've seen um, Fortress being used. So, as you can see here, this is a uh, North Carolina installation. They have the Evolve with the Solar Converter. And this is for a grid tied for backup based in North Carolina. Now you see here, the cool thing I like about this one is that they have an EV charger. So this whole system is kind of what I envision for the future of energy to which you have solar on the roof, 
a comprehensive hybrid inverter with a large battery bank and an EV charger. So everything you're producing, generating, and then delivering is all local. And if the grid does go out because of a major weather phenomena, you do have backup for all the loads in your home. So this one's really neat. Um, one other thing I like to point out on this, if you see over here, it comes on wheels on the side. So there's no lifting or, or picking it up or everything. You're just gonna wheel it onto site or have Scott wheel it onto site, let's say. And then it's very easy for maintenance because it's just one plug, one wire going up into the terminals on the Solar converter. So this is with the Solark 8K and the Evolt 18.5. Uh, if you'd screen, if you'd zoom in here, you'd see that LC display is flashed up in lighting, and they have the addition of this EV charger here. This is like a fully comprehensive system. Now, if we keep going, I mentioned that the E-Flex is a more flexible option. So on this, we have an Outback inverter, looks like a Radian inverter, with four of our E-Flex 5.4s in a backup application. Now, the thing here, and I mentioned you can put this on the floor or in a server rack or on the wall, this is how you would set up your server rack if you chose to go with four of the E-Flexes versus one E-Vault. Now you might be wondering, well, Alex, why would I fill up a cabinet with four E-Flexes versus one E-Vault Max? It's a great question. Maybe down the road you wanna expand your system more modularly so you get another rack and you put three E-Flexes per rack to get you around 30 kilowatt hours of total capacity. So it's a little bit more flexible for sizing, um, but also you can be pretty creative with what kind of cabinet you wanna put the E-Flex in. Um, although we do have a, a cabinet solution here at Fortress that you could consider for your project. So this one's 21.6 kilowatt hours, tied in with an Outback inverter for backup power. So this may be used where the power goes off in this facility, not sure what the, where this was located. The Outback would signal to the battery to flip on in the event of an outage and then the energy storage system, the E-Flexes, would then deliver that power to the loads in your home, uh, whatever you so choose, refrigerator, lights, modem, et cetera, et cetera. And I believe this is the last one we have for you here, um, uh, is the solar converter. We have four of the E-Flexes in parallel um, for backup power, just like the last one. But you see how they wall mounted it. So I like this uh, installation a lot because maybe you don't have room on a wall somewhere where you can put a flex rack or you can put an Evolve Max. So you can put four of them on the wall, very clean, very much so out of the way, for example, in a garage, and then you would hook it right up with the inverter of choice. Here we have a Solark. I believe this is a 12 kW inverter. So we have a lot of different ways to install, um, depending on wh what your home what your home project is like. Now, that being said, I want to introduce um, the man, the myth, the legend, Scott, and he has a few case studies and other things he's going to pass along as well. So Scott, I'll let you take it away from here. All right, thanks a lot, Alex. Uh, it's great. It's been great working with you um, on a almost I want to say daily basis, but weekly basis with these uh, Fortress battery orders and. And just working, uh, I was thinking about when I first met Fortress was at an intersolar conference in California and met Jing, your CEO. And um, that was an awesome experience. And she ended up, we talked about testing batteries, doing YouTube videos. And so I have two of the Evolt 18.5s that allowed me to transition from kind of moving from my, I was very hesitant to get into lithium because of the cost, as you mentioned, it's come way down. I said, okay. Because Tesla, the name Tesla was kind of taken over and everybody wanted a Tesla when we were still in lead, flooded lead acid batteries and, and AGMs and everybody wanted a Tesla. And we're like, oh, we don't. And they didn't really have their act together whether we're going to do DC coupled or AC coupled batteries. And so we just held off. And then when we went to InterSolar and said, so it's time for us to get into lithium and met Jing. And that was great. And we started to uh, do some testing. So I made that transition. Um, and we still do lead because of the EMP hardening. I'm seeing a lot of questions come in here, so those will be addressed later, hopefully. And we're still not able to EMP harden in a lithium, um, an LFP battery at this point. And so we can talk about replaceable BMSs. I'll put that back on you, Alex. But it's been great working with you folks. Um, even, and just for folks to know the, and I've been blown away by the tech support. Um, the, we do a lot, you know, for the inverters and panels and ground mounts and batteries. And I've really enjoyed working with, um, I think John, um, 
brought Discord into into your company as a uh, a way to not have to sit on the phone, pick a number, and I get a number. I'm not picking on Outback, but I get a case study, get a case number, and then maybe they'll get back to you in three days. Um, I can Discord John on that on my phone on a laptop, and I'm getting a hold of somebody at Fortress. Ticket, tickets are generated, and I'm real time. I know that's not part of our talk here today, but I just wanted to say that. If you're in trouble or you need some help with the battery or installation or updating firmware, um, I, that that was an amazing platform. I can send pictures, videos, talk. Um, he bailed me out. I was 26 feet underground putting a battery in a had a problem with a battery, needed a firmware update, and he was able to uh, help me through that uh, uh, in an underground off-grid bunker installation. So. Um, it's been great working with with uh, with Fortress, so I will say that. So I guess I'm going to jump into my case studies, and uh, the first one is going to be kind of alluded to that is how I transitioned from lead to lithium. Again, I still keep, I still have a lead acid forklift battery that I maintain and put distilled water in, and it gases off, and it needs vent fans and relays, and all of these things are not required on an LFP battery, which is like. At first, I had to, my first Fortress installation was like, are you kidding me? That is so easy compared to what we've been doing for years and bringing this giant lead battery, 24 two volt cells, putting battery, you know, water, watering kits on them, venting them, make sure the charge controller turns the relay on, that turns your fan on, and not having it in a place that is going to, you know, be in a home, you know, make sure it's vented very well. So that was one of the first things, um, transitioning from lead to lifting, just how, like, this is too easy. This is like too easy of an installation. So I rolled these two e-vaults in, and this picture is of um, kind of my lab where I experiment with my Outback Radiant. I have Solarks and Outbacks, and I have lead and I have lithium. And so we just constantly go back and forth. So um, and just in testing things. And so I was, I've been amazed at the ease of installation, probably was the first, the biggie. As you said, even though it's a heavy battery, I rolled it in on casters, hooked it up. Because it's a one battery of 18 and a half kilowatts, I only have a two, I have home runs, I land on the positive and negative. It's got a built in 250 amp breaker, everything that you kind of need um, for a, you know, a proper installation. So I, I, the Evolt is too easy. Um, it's, it, it might be a little bit pricier and it is, but there's a lot of things that, you know, you're not using bus bars and cabling and racks and it's just all in one. So, and it's, it saves a lot of space too. You can roll it into places, you know, people put them up in closets and things that you could not do in the lead acid world or even the AGM world. So, and then performance. So when I, if I run loads and testing out things, I can run HVAC equipment and pumps and things, I'm getting better performance. It's just the the response time, even though lead acid is a workhorse, the lithium performs better, it's faster. Um, I can run more with these batteries. Trying to compare amps to amps and amp hours to amp hours as closely as I can, I'm still getting better performance out of the lithium. Not only that, being able to discharge this battery, I got some applications where customers they don't understand electricity, their usage, and they beat their batteries to death. And I can't get away with that with lead. As you know, you, it's like, don't ever go over below 50% discharge, you can destroy your battery. And I've had some of these, I've taken an e-vault not willingly down to 1% and been able to bring it back. It's just customers are not understanding how much power they're actually using. But their quick recovery, the fast charge times, I can go on and on about it, but the, the perf performance improvement, between lead and lithium is a no-brainer. I was kind of late to the game. I was kept watching, talking to other installers. Everybody jumped into lithium, and I was like, mm, I don't know if we're ready for it. But uh, Fortress was our first step into LFP uh, chemistry, and it's been fantastic. I'm glad. I'm glad we went with Fortress on that. So deep discharge, ease of installation, performance. I mean, it's yeah. If you've ever installed a, you know. A 2,500 pound, 3,000, 4,000 pound lead acid battery, and and had to maintain it. Um, like I just filled up my battery the other day, and I had to equalize it. Well, it was too full, and I, the, you know, bring out the, you know, so no, I don't have baking soda on my truck now to try to neutralize all the overspill and or people overfill their batteries, and it's all over, and it's ruining their floors, and 
So there's some things that you see from an installation standpoint with a unmaintained or a poorly maintained lead acid battery that's kind of like you leave it, it looks awesome, it's working great, you come back in a year or two years and it's a disaster. The batteries are bulging, they haven't been filled with water, so it doesn't take long. Like you said before, Alex, a lead battery can last, a flood, it can last a long time if it's taken care of. I know guys that have batteries that are 20 years old but they babysit them. And most customers do not do that unless they're just geared towards that and they, they destroy their battery. Where the lithium has, between your BMS and its chemistry and the inverter working with the battery, there's a lot of protection that people, they don't even know that eat all the balancing of the cells, the charging, the power in, the power out being managed really saves that investment and where you know people get very upset when they're like i spent six thousand dollars on that lead battery and now i have to replace it in five years four five six years and with the lithium with the eight thousand ten thousand cycles you know hopefully 16 plus years 17 years we don't we don't have that so that's it's great so all right i guess that's on the lead versus lithium making that transition has been fun um it's easier the installations are faster and um, there's really no reason to go lead <laughs> other than uh, EMP hardening, which is a niche in our market, um, working with Solark and their EMP harden inverters. And you know, we've talked to Fortress, we've talked to you folks about possible field replaceable BMSs. I know one of the questions that came up, what's the difference in the, in the Max and the Classic? And I don't know, and maybe you can answer this, Alex, are we able to get field replaceable BMSs. I know that's kind of been talked about. It's one thing I keep saying over and over. If there, if we could have a field replaceable BMS, then I could kind of move towards an EMP hardening. I don't know if you can say anything to that. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a really good question and I get it quite often. And that's the benefit and first of having a lithium battery is the battery management system is really tailor-made um, for lithium batteries. It's not something that lead acid batteries have. So it's a new problem on what do I do with the BMS and how do I change it out if I need to. Now that's something, if you needed a field serviced battery management system, you'd get in touch with my technical support team and then they would essentially, if you know, going through the processes of, okay, what happened with your current BMS? Um, how are you using the battery? Learning more about your usage and things like that, providing it to where you can you know, replace the BMS essentially. Now we do have instruction on this. We don't recommend that anybody do that. There is some training we would recommend you go through or um, calling someone like Scott, who's very knowledgeable to replace a BMS just to avoid any errors. But it is something that we can do you know, if there is a problem, you contact your technical support team, they get more information on your project and then get you through those next steps of, okay, we're gonna send you a BMS. Um, who's gonna be doing the swap for you? If you're doing the swap, here is some training for you to get you familiar and then take those next steps from there. It's a really good question. Very good, very good. It, would, it is a plug and play. If you could get an extra BMS and you know how to replace a, a BMS if it failed in an event, then that would be one way to mitigate the EMP event. So. All right, I think we'll go on to the next slide. All right, off-grid, we do a lot of off-grid. We do hybrids, the, the, the inverters are so awesome now that they are hybrid, they're multimodal. So I can do grid tie, battery backup, net meter, time of use, off-grid, any mixture and any combination of that. And having a battery that can respond and be used in any of those modes is awesome and we use the battery in all those modes sometimes on an inverter like a solar there's three modes checked you know we're doing grid cell time of use and limited power to um we can offset another panel limited power to home and so there, it's 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 great so, so here's a few pictures here's one of uh, uh, being in a bunker uh it's an atlas shelters 26 feet underground um getting all that equipment in there is a challenge at times and um but it is these are the type of applications where you can't cheat. There's no grid power. You're, you're relying on that battery. That, if that battery doesn't work, you can't live. What I mean is that air, that Swiss air blower to the left of the battery, if that isn't working, you are not breathing. So to have a robust system working, um, and like you have, it has to work and it has to work well. And I, with a lead, you can't, do have a let you, you just can't vent anything in this space so this is a safe battery 
It allows you to run off grid. You do not need grid support. And we're doing more and more off grid because people are, as you mentioned, moving, they're working uh, virtually. They just want to go off the grid. They don't want to deal with the Texas storms. They don't want to deal with the fires in California. They just want to live off grid. So it's fun starting, especially new construction, designing a system that can totally work off grid. Now I take the, where I come from on this is minimizing the battery. I know I shouldn't be saying that because you guys are trying to sell batteries, but I try to minimize the number of batteries in a system. And I can do that more with lithium than I can with lead because lead, you got to kind of buy a batch at the same time. You can't add a battery six months, or you shouldn't years later, add one battery to that mix if one's died. Because of the BMSs, you can add batteries years later, same battery to that match they're kind of independently adjusting according to their life and the cells are ba being balanced individually so i start small and a lot of times i have to start small it's the customer's budget they can't afford to buy four e-volt maxes they're expensive but they can start with one get the system up and running and then they realize as they build their house as they build their business and they add more loads they can add another battery. So it makes all the systems scalable, where before a system wasn't as scalable as it is now with LFP. You can scale, I, but I do start really small and people are like, you need more battery. I know people are like, I can't afford the battery. And so we just, but I can, I have several systems out there, don't tell anybody, Alec, but um, that are one E-Flex. You know, that is not real on a, on a, on a Solar 12K, that's not a good balance, but that's what they could afford. But what did it do for them? Well, they have water, they're off grid, they've got water pumping, they're just, everything's kind of limited, but we program the inverter so it's not beating up that E-Flex battery and it works just fine in, in that. And now they're gonna add a battery next year when they can afford it. So the scalability of the Fortress batteries, the LFP chemistry is, is awesome. It allows people to get into solar battery backup just because they can afford it now and they can scale up later on. So it's a few times down in bunkers in the Atlas shelter. I don't know if I'm ever gonna, it's a, it's a crazy project. It's, you know, a complete house upside down. You know, you're doing things, you know, from the plumbing, everything has to work. Your everything's upside down. Your, your septic system's got to pump, your, um, the air you got to bring down in, everything's got to be safe. You got to control your carbon dioxide level carbon monoxide, so a lot of these have, they become quite a uh, experiment in a quality of life. So there's a lot going on here. This is a contained environment, and to be able to have a battery that works in that environment is pretty, pretty awesome. So single cabinet, obviously, we let this thing down in, you know, it's 400 pounds, so we brought it down in with a crane because we had to lean out hundreds of feet and then bring it down with a crane down into, the, into, a, into a shaft. And, uh, but it's been awesome. Both of them that I've done have worked great in that. So, and then we do a lot of just off-grid installs. Somebody builds a cabin in the middle of nowhere. It costs five, you know, fifty thousand dollars to run power lines to that home, that cabin, that off-grid retreat. And now we can design systems that really function awesomely. With you know, we do request that they consider getting a generator in case that you know, as a backup to their system. And the beauty of the lithium, guess it charges so fast compared to a lead acid. I can just, you know, just to watch the current dump into that, you're watching that screen, it's like, oh, 100 amps, no problem. Consistently dumping 100 plus amps into that battery. That's that's great. And, um, and it doesn't take a large generator to do that's a five kilowatt generator. Um, so we, we do a lot of like 10K, 11K, 12K generators, and that works good for charging a system like that. So um, off grid, we are everywhere putting in off grid systems from Michigan to Arkansas. I can't we're we're having to I, I, I should I've got to be careful what I say. Uh, <laughs> we have so much work now closer to home, thankfully, but we have gone in a lot of places. And now we're transitioning to helping folks. We design the system, we incorporate these, you know, the fortress batteries, solar converters, solar systems, design it. And um, so a lot of people have questions on sizing. I think sometimes people spend too much time trying to figure out every single load and what they need when they really need something. <laughs> and that's the th beauty of this. I can give them a system that works and they can add to it. It's like, let me get, I know about what you need and this is going to work. So let's work it from the other standpoint. Here's a great working system. And if you can adjust your lifestyle to live with the sunshine, you know, make hay while the sun shines, you're not beating on that battery like you think you are. You just adjust your lifestyle. You're living off grid. You're living here and working here. And 
there are systems that they're not even touching the battery because they do most of the heavy lifting when the sun is shining in ambient light with large solar arrays and they're not really working that battery to death. So that's a, there's a lot that we go into in, in off-grid. And of course, off-grid, we spend more time focusing on the appliances, the loads. The best money spent sometimes in solar is in the loads that are being run. Do you have soft start well pumps, soft start compressors, heat pumps? What is the technology? Do not build your home in a traditional American way, is what we keep telling people, because you're just gonna have to double the cost you spend on fortress batteries, solar converters, all these panels when you can, you, you really, I'm a design engineer, so I start from a design, everything, if the design is wrong, everything else falls apart. Financially, everything's not right in my mind if the system doesn't, if it doesn't make sense. It's just a mathematical problem. I got a, this much amp hours, this many kilowatts of surge, you know, this is what this pump pulls, this is what this heat pump pulls, and it's just, can I do it? Yes, and it's becoming easier to do off-grid systems. So um, so here, and on the bottom, we do the E-flexes. Um, I'm a little uh, anal retentive, so I don't like putting the fortress on its side where I have to read it sideways, so I put it so the fortress is horizontal. Sorry, Alex, it's just my problem I have. Um, so I put, <laughs> so we've done two, four, six, we put these batteries so that you're reading you know it, it doesn't you there's only one way you can't orient it and that's flipped all the way over right you can't flip there's one orientation where you can't flip it all the way over where fortress is upside down and that's the one orientation of the wall but we like the wall brackets it does save a lot of space if you got wall space and um and then we combine them in our wiring trough so there is a combiner uh, bus bar inside the wiring trough where those are parallel together we make sure our cable lengths are the same, that they're each, and then the, the batteries are all connected together. And, and now Fortress, obviously, as Alex mentioned, the closed loop communication with Solar. So now up pops a green dialog box and you can run that battery at a little bit higher voltage when you have closed loop communication, getting a little bit more, capacity, uh, better warranty, better uh, life out of the battery if the two, if everything's working together. So I like I like both there there's there are two totally different looks two totally different types of installation same obviously same battery chemistry and they perform the same they really do perform the same kilowatt to kilowatt if you're matching them up so we like it I typically undersize you can see two batteries in there Alex is saying no you shouldn't do that but they um, you can do I think the next slide I get into uh, time of use maybe let's do next slide yeah time of use. Cows are important. No, I'm just kidding. Um, just, uh, we got several farmers, off-grid farmers. This is a, just a dairy that we took off-grid. Um, I don't, if you deal with time of use where rates are very high, different times of the day, different times of the year, and that was this customer. And a lot of people don't believe this, but it's true. There's a co-op I work with and they charge $12 a kilowatt during this time of use. They charge five cents off of that zone. So it's really crazy. So this was so much fun. Just with two E-flexes, I was able to take, um, and they have no power bill for the rest of their life. That was fun. These two folks, they were hardworking, they got dairy farmers, and they, they anyway, long story, I've known them for a while. I said, I can do this. I can, let me, let me zero your power bill, and let me minimize the battery to do it. And let's see how it goes. So they, they could add battery, but they haven't needed to. So they have no power bill. Um, and during their time of use, we dump power out of these batteries to match the load that they're using in their home. And so we're, it's just offsetting their cost perfectly. Um, I knew it was on the edge with two batteries, but it's been absolutely fine. We do have closed loop communication between these batteries and the solar, and it's just awesome. I, I can watch it on our PowerView app and see that battery just dive in during that time of use because they're, make, they're running their air conditioners, they're running everything, and they're not using any of that $12 a watt, uh, $12 a kilowatt um, electricity. And so time of use is great. Time of use is also great for customers that don't want to connect to their utility. So the great way to use the battery is I'm, 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 I'm not connected to the utility. I don't have a net metering program. There's no interconnection. No, I'm not doing that. I don't want to for whatever reason but I wanna maximize the use of solar that I can produce on my property. So what we're doing is just discharging these batteries down to say 70, 80%. And I warned them, I said, you don't wanna be caught with a battery being low, but you have a generator. So if there's an event and the grid actually does go out, you can fire up that generator, get that battery back in condition within hours. 
So they're discharging every day out of this battery, cycling it down a certain amount. They're not killing it, Alex, I promise. They're staying within the specs and they're, they're bringing it down. And what is that doing? That's providing so much more room starting up in the morning that they can fill that battery and run their loads with their solar. So time of use is the time of use settings on these multimodal inverters really allow you to use that battery forever until it's run up, its life's run out. But it's it's a great way, and I'm and I have a lot of my customers tweaking and adjusting and adjusting appliances, their lifestyle, going from I only used 15 kilowatts today. And I'm like, yes, because you're doing things when you don't have solar and you don't have a buyback, you don't have an interconnection plan. So we move them to this time of use and they're up to 30, they're doubling the amount of solar that they can produce, minimizing their power bill. And that's a lot of fun. When, I, when you can give somebody a project and they, you know, they're doing it because they want off-grid power, they want backup power, most of them, and they get the tax credit. But when they don't have a, a power bill for the rest of their life, that's, a, that's pretty awesome. Um, it's pretty, it's very rewarding. So we can get away with two. I've got one customer and he's still running on one. He's limping along with one battery. I know he's a, but he's, he's got water for his, for his location. So the time of use is a great, you, I would never do this with a lead. I, I would never do this with an AGM battery or a lead acid battery. Those usually stay in float as much as possible, unless you're off grid and you're having to cycle. Then I don't like AGMs. We do flooded. So we can, you know, take that kind of abuse. But time of use with a lithium is a new world. It's it's fantastic. So next slide. I just want to say, Scott, for those that are unfamiliar with time of use rate charges, um, it, Southern California is a perfect example. So they'll charge, you know, using Scott's example, it was five cents from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Once 4 p.m. comes on, they'll change the billing rate to be $12 a kW from, let's say, 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. The yep. reason for this is that as solar gets more distributed, utility companies are losing money, especially with how net metering is nowadays. So that's why I think, you know, it's in the West, that's where I cover. I see it's, it's every single day I see time of use, batteries being used for time of use. Now, my folks here on the East Coast, it is coming. You know, looking at states like Georgia, even here in my home state of Pennsylvania, um, there is talk of picking up a time of use charge during peak times, nine out of 10 times. It's when you're at home, when you're using the most, so that so the utilities can make as much uh, money as they can during those peak times. So just a quick little clarification on what it is, where we see it, and obviously Scott has a lot of experience with it too. Yeah, it's great. And now we have a battery that works with it. So great. And most of our systems, I would say most, we're getting more and more off grid, but we do a lot of hybrids where they are grid connected or even grid time they're selling back and they want backup power. Then the battery is really, you know, it's not getting the, it's not being used as hard. It's not being abused because I can sell power back. I'm still net metered uh, one to one. I'm grandfathered into 2025, but after that, I'm going to be back onto a generator rate, and it's not going to be as good. I'm going to be using the battery more. So, net, as, as you know, net metering going away, more and more time of use uh, coming, to, you know, coming to the East Coast, as you mentioned, it's already in the West. Um, then the battery is going to be used more and more. So, um, just the yeah, the, I just started this slide. This was basically um, just showing just the simplicity. Uh, it's hard to, you know, you have to watch my videos. Um, a lot of our, is the, you know, just to see there's, this has saved so much time. It's like, where can I put the lid? I couldn't put the battery in there. I'd have to go someplace else. But this battery just slides in, hooks up, two little short six foot cables. I'm up and running, charging instantly. you able to use the system that day. It's just an awesome, it's an, it's for an installer. It's great. And I do a lot of designing of mech rooms. That's the SketchUp model I use. I just have all your batteries 3D modeled now. And so I can pretty much build a 3D, you know, a mech room really quick. And I try to design mech rooms like put all of this stuff in a mechanical room, your water, your hot water, your air HVAC, your solar system, your batteries, all in the same room. You walk in that room and you've got screens at eye height and you can go around and just check on everything. Here's my pressure's good, my temperature's good, my voltage is good. Um, I'm, everything is great. So we've done a lot of these. So a lot of times we'll design everything in 3D and then we'll take it. And that's how we build it when we go there. We don't get to the job and start scratching our head. Where does things go? So it's been a lot of fun building 
So we've got all the all the fortress stuff modeled, and it's it's kind of fun. We got a library of components that we can build your your mech room out. So we do a lot of a lot of a lot of hybrid systems, but we're doing so many more off grid. This picture on the one on the bottom is um, yeah, that one's that one is an off grid system in Idaho, and folks moved from California to Idaho, and all of a sudden we get we get it's so weird we get like six we got six or seven customers in Idaho, and most of them have moved from out of California to Idaho. They're like I'm done. I don't want to deal with this. I want, I want to go off the grid. Can I go off the grid? Sure, you can go off the grid. Now it, it's going to cost some money to, to if you want to live at the same level of power. You know, I got customers that have thirteen hundred dollar a month electric bills, and they want to go solar. And I'm like, uh, uh, this is not going to go well. I mean, unless they have the budget, and it goes well, very well for Alex and I. Um, but um, it's, but it's doable now. The technology is there. Whether you're hybrid, off-grid, time of use, it doesn't matter. And, and the Fortress is just sitting there working. However you program it, um, it works fantastic. So next slide. Guy, you mentioned a good point. I'm sorry to keep jumping in here. Um, but you have this ease of connection. And now, from your perspective, if you had many lead-acid batteries, let's say sitting on the floor here, you'd be making connections from each lead-acid battery right across. I'm going to take a zoom in here. You see right from where Scott puts this, uh, it's bus bar, trough, gutter, combiner. There's a lot of synonyms for it, but it's it's a positive and a negative four op cable running into that. He's landing the connections there. This is his main panel that's running into here, all connected to the solar converter. That's I think the you know, it came to mind because I saw it. He mentioned lead acid batteries. It's one battery here instead of many batteries on the floor. Cable, 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 cable. It's like you said, yeah, I think you put it perfectly, Scott. Six foot run right into the combiner, you're good to go. I thought that was just a really, really neat thing, honestly. And that good point. And just it's landing right on the solar breaker. It's there's no because it's one battery on this system. I don't have to combine. It's done. Where if I did a simplify, not picking on simplify. I think they just got bought out by Briggs and Stratton. Um, but anyway, simplify. We look at that, and you have this spaghetti of wires that have to be combined on bus bars to get less kilowatts than this battery so there's a there's a lot to be said for the cleanness of the installation i know this is just in a barn so we but we have some really nice pretty installations that you're not having this spaghetti of parallel cables and bus bars trying to hide and you can do that creatively with a lot of gutters but this is so easy um the e-vault so i'm bragging on the e-vault the e-flex is just as good it's just you know depends on the application and the budget so, all right, I think that's pretty much it on, on hybrid. And then uh, I don't know if it's time to jump into some Q&A. I think there's a lot of, a lot of questions. You gonna field these, uh, yeah. Alex? Or? Absolutely, absolutely. Let me scroll up here and I'll start reading some out. And before, before you jump in there, can I ask a question? I mean, this is on everybody's mind where, can you speak Please. at all to lead times uh, supply chain? We yeah. get, we're getting so many calls. People want to buy their, we can't get to them, but they want to stockpile their equipment, solar panels, ground mounts, batteries, inverters. They want them in their house. They want them in, 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 in hopes that we'll come get to them before the next six months. Availability of, of the product, specifically, you know, you know your, your two batteries. What's, what are we looking at? It's a really good question, Scott, and I'm sure if all you guys are keeping up with the news, the ports right now for shipping are a mess. So it's it's something that's not only just Fortress, but it is industry wide. I can speak to what I know, and that is our eFlex is readily available. I know our eVault Max probably has a seven to nine week lead time at the moment. It's not a matter of getting the product in, it's getting it through customs in the port um, to then be delivered. So our eFlex, if you know you had someone who wanna take advantage of 26% ITC by the year end, the eFlex would be the way to go. Um, if you were, you know, headstrong and going with the eVault Max, I would, I would guess around probably seven to nine weeks uh, on the more conservative side, just to account for all these delays that we're seeing, um, the higher volume moving up into the fourth quarter, because that's usually our busiest time of year as a battery manufacturer at the least. But it's a fair question. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's our busiest time of year, and everything's converging now. More, you know, it's just because of the because of the tax credit. End of year, people are going to be, it always ramps up. September, it takes off and it's just the way it is. But I just thank you because it's, um, people want their batteries. And um, so seven to nine weeks, yikes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
So I have a question here um, from a Mark Chandler. When is the E Vault more appropriate than the E Vault Max and vice versa? Um, Scott, I can handle this. I think, Mark, we are phasing out the E Vault Classic, as I call it, to go to the E Vault Max. The E Vault Max has a, it's a UL 9540 listing. It's a certain listing that's done through a NERDL or a national recognized testing laboratory. So typically I've been, I've been recommending the Max because it's all the certifications that are typically needed. It's more scalable um, in just terms of, you know, 12 E Vaults versus 20 E Vault Maxes. It's more scalable and it's our latest and greatest. So we are going to be um, phasing it out if we haven't already, the eVault. So I would just say go with the eVault Max as our latest and greatest. Comes with the same 10-year warranty, prismatic lithium iron phosphate cells. And then again, budget, if they can't and they want to still do a system, that eFlex gets them into a system that is scalable, right? I mean, they can okay. still right get that. You have the eFlex. If people are like desperately needing a system, they can get your reflexes. Okay, let's see. Drew had a good question. Storage in cars is less than $200 per kilowatt hour at retail. Why is it $2,000 a kilowatt hour in houses? Scott, do you wanna take a, take a stab at that? Um, I don't know if it is $200 per kilowatt for cars. I don't know if it is, is it that low? There are some lithiums out there. Um, Fortress, well, let me just, um, Fortress is a premium brand. So you have people on Alibaba selling batteries for $200 for homes a kilowatt, but there's no warranty, there's no tech support. If it gets discharged too low, you're not gonna get it back. And then what do you do? You just, you know, so there's a lot of batteries like that. And we talk with the inverter manufacturers and say, I ask them all to, okay, what battery? Because I start with the design. It's like, what battery is working great with your inverter? And you know, where are they with the closed loop communication? Blah, blah, blah. And then that, and people are like buying all these, you know, I won't name names of batteries that are out there. They're buying them like crazy, but they don't have any warranty, no tech support. And I was told by some of the inverter companies, if they're too discharge but like below 20 percent for any reason they will not come back and they've got to be sent back to who somewhere in china to you know you're you're you so there are some cheap lithium comparable to your 200 dollars a kilowatt there are some that we've installed around the 400 dollars kilowatt what are you alex are you like um you more like a thousand 1300 on the evolve max i think so i'd have to dump, i'd have to jump into the math um i don't know off the top of my head but i could find out but I don't think they're 2,000, Drew. I, you know, I even the 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 best Evol Max. I think it's 14 thousand dollars. You're looking at a, what's that? A 1,300, 1,200 to 1,300 dollars a kilowatt. Um, but don't leave out the ease of installation and the breakers that are built in. You get a lot of batteries out there. They have no overcurrent protection. There, um, there's a lot of cabling and combining that has to happen. A rack that has to be purchased. Any racking, if you ever buy a rack, they're not cheap um so there's costs associate installation time complexity racking cabling bus bars that come along with this one cabinet on casters so apples to apples you gotta you know be careful there um, but there are batteries there's the whole realm from i'd say 400 well no there are the cheap batteries you're probably down to 200 dollars a kilowatt so you can get a cheap lithium battery they're out there you can buy them and there's people on youtube promoting and pushing them and they do work um, it's just, I can't do that to my customer. I'm like, oh, your battery's dead. Uh, and you live seven hours from me. Um, sorry, I have no way. What do I do? All right. So they, they got to move out of their house or they got to, you know, they'll lose all their food. I've got no way to fix that. I can't do tech support on that battery. So be careful. I'm buying the cheapest out there. And there's people building their own, taking car batteries. There's people building their own lithiums, buying BMSs have done amazing jobs. So if you're capable of doing that, go for it. But if you want, a, if you don't know what in the world we're even talking about and you just want power for your, you know, your virtual job, you know, then, then go with something that's got tech support, backing, quality, reputation, and you're going to pay more. So I don't know Absolutely. if I answered the question. Absolutely. I had another question from Drew um, regarding the bunker system project, Scott. How is it charged? Is that hooked up to a solar array? Um, yeah, is that yeah. solar array? Yeah, that is oh, that's 100% solar. That was on a 24 panel seasonal adjust ground mount that was about um, three, 400 feet away. 
So, you know, you can't give away your bunker location. So you put your solar way away, like it's running your house or something, but it's really actually running the bunker. So we put the solar a thousand feet away from the system, but it is being charged on solar, um, 350 to 400 volt strings coming into the solar, charging that 48 volt, 50, 50 volt battery. So yeah, and we do have diesel generators. Diesel generators are in the gen pod on the other side of the bunker. So we can charge diesel, never put propane in a bunker, but um, so we have diesel non, you know, not safer in a gen pod. So we have di small diesel generators and solar. Nice. And you can hook it to the grid if you want to. So I have a question from Paul Kingsley. It might be a good um, kind of, you know, case study almost. Designing and installing a 4.7 kW PV array with a solar converter. Once a battery set up to start with, powering a construction site, um, which is, he puts it as a DIY or small crew that works every day, and then using this to power some of the system in the house until it's complete. And then basically he says, I want to decide whether to grow the system to go off grid if feasible. What battery do you typically suggest starting off, Scott, um, just based off the information we have here from Paul? I mean, with 4.7 kilowatt, and you don't, and it's just you're working. Obviously, it's a, I'm thinking through this as a it's a construction site. You're working during the day for the most part, so you've got solar. Um, you've got this 4.7 actually working for you. So I mean, you could get away. I mean, if you really, if, if the tools need the capability of the 12k, which is 37 and a half amps off grid, then you do need at least 10 kilowatts of lithium. To make it work so you'd need two e flexes to make that work or one e vault one e vault matches up nicely with a solar one one e vault but that's a lot for a construction portable gen so i would think you could do two e flexes would be that'd be a good balance two e flexes with that size solar array i hope that helps perfect a lot of questions here folks bear with me how do you respond to a hot garage yeah, there's a question on, on heating a hot garage, dealing with it. A lot of our installations, we do add some sort of HVAC temperature control because the batteries can't be below 32 degrees. They can't get too hot. They get derated once they're over 113 degrees. I think you have a, a deration on the Fortress battery. Same with on the inverter too, once you get that hot. So if they're in a really hot place, they're gonna be derated. So you don't wanna do that. So we're adding uh, mini splits, uh, small, um, window in any inverter based HVAC and it's infinite right now you can get there's so many there's hundreds of brands of um, HVAC equipment that will and you don't have to run it at 60 degrees you can run it at 85 degrees barely pull any power but it keeps the humidity out of the space it keeps um, it uh, you know just operating that inverter in the 70 degree 80 degree range is perfect good for the battery so we, we add a lot of HVAC to our systems because some people just want a powerhouse. They want a, their house wasn't designed for solar. It's like, Scott, I can't fit three E volts in here. I can't fit all these inverters you say I need. Great, let's build a powerhouse. And in that powerhouse, we'll take care of the temperature and the climate control, whether we need to heat or cool with a mini split that's on a critical loads panel in that powerhouse. So when this is, we get into, Critical loads everywhere. You know, you go, we go to the house, like we're going to run your critical loads in the house. Oh, but I got a shop. I've got a barn. I've got animals. I got the powerhouse. And we, sometimes we end up splitting the power and going to four to five buildings on the property. And that's very doable if the person can manage and understand how much power they're using. They just want power to run that freezer that's in the other house, the other building. So, yeah. Um, Temperature is very important and it's not a, you know, you can get a mini split for a thousand dollars that heats and cools in just about any county in the United States. And they're getting better and better in cold climates too, running in, in, in uh, they're running in Canada. And uh, so, yeah, we do a lot with that just to keep, you want to keep your equipment nice. Just because it can run at 112 degrees doesn't mean you should run it at 112 degrees. You, you know, you just, you know, a little bit of HVAC is, is good. It's creative ways to use HVAC. Put a heat pump water heater in the space where your batteries and your inverter are. And anytime you make hot water, it dehumidifies and cools that space. There's a lot that you can do um, in the beginning design work to make that equipment last forever. That's how it's 
I'm going to knock out two more questions here as we come up into our hour time frame. Um, the one question I have, and it's a little bit for both me and Scott, is from Bob Mara. He's looking to build a home in New Hampshire where the cost to bring power is crazy, quote unquote. Can we build and have creature comforts off the grid yet be protected from winter days where solar is just not enough to keep the batteries charged? Bob, there is consultation available. I think, um, you know, on, I would connect with Scott and tell him a little bit more about your home, what you're looking to do. I mean, not what you're looking to do, obviously move off the grid, but how big is your home? What kind of loads do you have in your home? Uh, Scott, any other advice for people looking to build an off-grid system? What do they need to know to come back to you with? I think like their load profile, a proposed solar array, anything off the top of your head? Yeah, location-wise, because we just finished the system in Maine, uh, right on the Canadian border. We did one last year on the Canadian border in Vermont. So it would come that weather-wise that he's doing. So we can talk about that uh, later. You can send me an email. We can go through it. But you should be able to do this off-grid. You don't need to bring power in. And those systems I'm talking about in Maine and in Vermont are totally off grid, no power ever going to go in there. So it's very doable. Um, you just got to have there's some creative um, ways in cold climate. It's been a, if, if, to me, I started designing for cold climates. Um, what, I got some at Wyoming at 8,000 feet, uh, Colorado at 9,000, the Vermont job, the Maine job. It's like if, it, if I can get that where you have the creature comforts in those environments, I can do it anywhere. And there's things like the Cold Climate Institute in Alaska where they're growing food and all the creature comforts that you want can be done with the technologies that are available today. You just got to, you might not know that they exist. You've got people with heat pumps making uh, their house at 70 degrees when it's 28 below zero with a heat pump. Okay. So, and that's running on electricity from a battery based system, solar system. So, there's a lot of building practices that help in all of this, of course, insulation and, and, and that kind of stuff. So um, it's very doable in New Hampshire. I know that. Yeah. And the last and final question here for the webinar uh, is from Adam Keithen. Are you seeing any market for battery backup projects that are not time of use rate or off grid? Uh, one that comes to mind for me, Adam, is somewhere like Northern California, where you have all this inclement weather. Um, and you know, the need for backup, not even using it for time of use or moving completely off the grid is essentially paramount. So that's what I've seen here. And I have a very specific experience with the West. Um, that's one market that comes to mind for strictly backup projects. Scott, maybe you'd agree that another one might be Florida, since you know there are a lot of storms that come through and things like that, maybe on the East Coast. Any comments on that? Yeah. I have, yeah, I've stayed out of Florida. Florida's hard if you're out of state to install solar in, from what I gather. So, um, yeah, we've only had this, what I mentioned in my um, time of use slide before is just that I don't have a lot of experience um, other than it is a great way to utilize the battery. And even if you don't live in a place that uses time of use rates, it's a feature that you can take advantage of today and you're using your battery to do that. And so, um, yeah, I don't, I can't, you speak more to the utility side of it than I would, Alex. So um, I don't think you're gonna convince a utility of anything. No. Well, I think most people, if they don't do it for backup or time use, they use it for self-use. So they'll actually get solar and battery and use the utility as a backup source um, instead of vice versa. And that's called a self-use application. It also can be used in areas where they're not allowing net metering at all. One that comes to mind is Hawaii. In Hawaii, there is no net metering. So any excess production made from your solar, any generation, if it's not going to the load, it's, you know, it's gone. So having a battery in self-use applications, if they're saying, uh-uh, you're not allowed, capture all that extra energy, discharge it maybe at night, um, instead of just having all your excess energy just basically go away. So that could be something, that's another application on which you can use a battery too. Okay. Perfect, guys. So I want to, Scott, thank you again for jumping on this webinar here. Um, I hope everybody found it very helpful and informative regarding, you know, talking with Scott um, directly here, answering your questions. Now you'll see here, you have my direct email um, and my phone number and the same thing over with the team at Practical Preppers. If you have any other questions, um, if you want to get in contact with Scott regarding your home project, shoot him over a quick email, let him know what you're looking to do and let the best get to work. Um, other than that, I think we are good to go. Scott, do you have any closing notes here on your end? No, I really appreciate the opportunity. It's great. Um, 
just work on that lead time, would you, Alex? I'm, I'm working on it. You're going to see me driving over to uh, driving across the country, delivering batteries by hand if I have to. <laughs> awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, again. Take care now.